Ground floor. Zuleika, you're great, but you are so difficult to plan with. That is just a fact. I, Z- I'm so sorry, hey. I'm 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 working on it. I'm work. The problem is is my schedule, hey. Yeah. That's the problem. What do you mean? What's what's busy in your schedule? Like what what takes up the most of your time? Like oh, like literally, every other day, I always like have have a um a panel discussion. Like tomorrow, I have a panel discussion that's um, with an organization in Doha, in um, Qatar. And then on Friday, I have, especially with this year, because it's the 150th of Charlotte's um, Matrege, there's a launch on Friday in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we're going to um, VUT in um, Sedibang, the campus in Sedibang. Mm. So literally, and things... Like I'm always the problem is also is a lot of the discussions this year with in terms of the Charlotte's Mantega Institute have been like in different um institutes outside the province, like UFS, U um UCT, Forte, different institutions. And so literally I would get confirmation like the night before of like the flight ticket and then mm. the details and like okay, we're leaving at this time. So that's what makes it complicated. And then, like, also, like, a lot of my stuff are, like, planned, like, a month before. So, and also, like, the book. So a lot of the things in my schedule are actually in pencil because some of them are still waiting for confirmation. I see. I think, uh, I mean, when I I started this podcast Mm -hmm. in October last year, um, and the first guest I had on was was, uh, David... Who's a friend of mine, and then I had. I and in had, general, I'm working on it. I'm a bad texter. Is it a bad texter? All right. I, I think I would consider myself, or m- maybe some people would describe me as a bad texter as well, because I try yeah, to. You're bad because you're offline when, like, I would say young people are online. Young people? Yeah, you're offline. You're, you're 18, aren't you? Yes, yeah. but you're offline. When, I'm, t- I'm when, three years older than I you. I know, but you're offline when we're online. Everyone else, when everyone else is... You're referring to the fact that I go to sleep at 9 p.m. That's what yes. you're talking about. You're off. That is so... I think I last slept <laughs> at 9 p.m. when I was, like, in grade three. No, you got to get that. Those early morning hours are good. Those early morning hours... you you got to understand. Like, when you wake up early and you... you um, you're out of bed, you you know, usually it depends. My I, I've tried very hard to be that person who gets up and immediately, like, goes and does cardio. Yeah. Um, but that's crazy. I'm not there yet. We'll get there someday. But um, if you just wake up really early, you go, you sit at your laptop, you've got your cup of coffee, mm-hmm. and you get started on your work. First things first, uh, nobody's going to bother you for for hours. Like for two, three hours at least, you're not going to be bothered. And it's dead, dead quiet. So those early morning hours are, are amazing for so productivity. What time do you wake up? Usually five. Five. Yeah. yeah. So you you were or about ten to five. So you wake up at five. I go. I watch the news. Wake up at six thirty. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, you go to sleep very late for someone who wakes up at six thirty. <laughs> so Lanka will say to me. She says, "Oh, uh, yes. I will confirm this. I'll send you a message by like eleven. Is that okay?" And I'll say, "Okay." Is it like I'm not gonna get it at eleven. I'll get it tomorrow morning, but uh, eleven is fine. You know, <laughs> send it through whenever you can. But yeah. So as I was saying, I mean. I started this podcast in October. Mm. This is now episode 21. Mm. And, um, or no, 22. Episode mm. 22. Because 21 is with Heike Berg. It's not out yet. Um, it'll come out on Friday. But yeah, so um, I contacted you. You were actually amongst the first people I contacted. Wait, are, is, are we starting the podcast now? Yeah, we started minutes ago. <laughs> 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 um, so, so yeah. The, I'm a bad text in front of everyone. <laughs> So, okay. so um, yeah, so I, I contacted a handful of people. The first people I contacted were some people I know, and then also people who were sort of um, interesting interesting to me, mm-hmm. people I thought would be interesting to talk to. So I contacted uh, Lexi, who runs Lexi's Eatery, a vegan restaurant. Oh, There's a bunch that, of them. Oh, yeah. I had a lovely chat with her. But you were amongst those first people. And the reason why was actually because 
So this, this idea of a podcast has been mulling in my head for a long time. And I remember back when the whole hair debate was happening in South Africa, I used to watch um, the news at night on CakeNet, the Afrikaans news. And I, I saw you there um, talking to the camera at the time. And I, 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 like, I didn't think anything of it. I just I was on CakeNet. Yes, you, ah, of course you were. You were on the news. So um, I saw you. It, I, like, I just made a mental note of this person. And I went on with my life. And then a few years later, when the podcast was an idea in my head of maybe I should do this, then I thought to myself, you know, there's that, what was that girl? Like there was that girl I saw her on the news. She's really young um, she's with the hair stuff. And I thought, yes, maybe. And luckily during this period when I was, um, you know, sort of thinking about maybe doing the podcast, you popped up, you popped up on the news again. And I was like, ah, same girl. Okay, so I took... <laughs> on the news again? Yes, you were on. You were commenting on something. Yeah. Um, it was short. It wasn't like the previous time. But I knew it was you. I recognized you. So I just wrote your name down in the notes on my phone. And oh. I went and I found your Instagram. And I followed you on Instagram. And then months after that, when the podcast was actually, you know, now I've bought the mics. Here we go. Then I contacted you. But just so, ladies and gents, just so you know, Zuleika. A contact in October. <laughs> I said, okay, cool. Let's do this podcast. I explained sort of what the idea is. The podcast wasn't nearly as big then. I had like five listeners. The tiny little thing. And uh, Zulaik says, yes, that's fine. Great. Let's do it. We rescheduled on Zulaika's request, by the way. I was always ready to go. We rescheduled, I think, at least five times. Like we rescheduled once because Zuleika had another engagement. Then we rescheduled two separate times for COVID-related purposes or reasons. Then we re we rescheduled again it because was bad in something January. came up. It was bad. People were dying in January. <laughs> it was uh, hectic. But here we are, finally. Yeah, and also sitting down last year this. when the podcast started, it was when I started writing finals. Mm. That is true. Zuleika is a, is a child. She is a, she's <laughs> first year this year. So when I contacted her for the first time, she was like right at the cusp of her matric final exams, um, which was mind-blowing to me. But uh, yeah, we, we managed to do it. Here we are. We're yeah. doing it today. So um, Zuleika, a, a lot of the people that, I, that listen to this podcast will not know who you are. So please tell the people, just, you know, a, sh a summary, who you are, what your claim to fame is, what you believe, what you do. Go ahead claim to fame that's a very that's a very um, i always say claim to fame and even famous people don't know what to say to that that's a like, very it's but, a very weird 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 statement um it's very weird but um yeah my name is Zuleika patel i'm an anti-racism and social justice activist and author as well as an ambassador of the charlotte's manuman institute and i'm also a student at the university of limpopo Okay, so I find this quite interesting. There's a couple of different things I want to talk about because I feel like maybe we're definitely going to have some conflicting opinions on a few things and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to debating some things with you. So, and, and obviously keeping in mind that you are very young, you know, and it's sort of you've only just stepped into, into the limelight as a representation of a lot of these ideas, as a spokesperson for a lot of these ideas. So, well, so so let's first just make sure we're talking about the same thing. So do, what is your definition of racism? Because I've heard a lot of people have a lot of different definitions. What, from your perspective, what is racism? Okay, when we talk racism in a South African context, you talk institutionalized racism, you talk interpersonal racism, and you talk um, structural and systemic racism. And now interpersonal racism takes place through... Um, through one-on-one -on -one conversations amongst people, which usually usually tends to be from from a group which has been placed, which has been placed at a at a much more superior position economically, and so therefore, therefore they have um they've been granted um a greater power in society due to an oppressive system which we just come out of, which we do know white people economically economically have resource means, and um in the in a country like ours, having economical power means having 
societal power, right? And so interpersonal takes place over conversations. And that stems mainly from what is then also internalized racism, which is what was socialized into learning, what is planted into us, what we're taught to believe, like how white people were conditioned by the apartheid government intensively to believe that they are superior, to believe that black people are inferior and to believe that um, there's a a a there's, there's a there's a there's a line of separation between us like um, the dynamic of of Mifro and bass mm. right in a south african context <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why you're laughing i'm using a real example no i i i just love the way you love the way you say it um it just sounds it sounds uncomfortable in your mouth it's funny please, <laughs> please continue afrikaans was never an easy subject for me. I actually, when when you said um, it was, it, what did I get at my final mark? <laughs> I'm gonna tell all your viewers my final Afrikaans mark. Um, but I'm very proud of my mark. I got a fifty-four. A fifty-four for yeah. FAL. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you I'm had very, to do stompy, stompy, and the whole like language language structure. Okay, it's interesting. Uh, did anyone else notice? I just wanna I wanna put this up. It sounds like, to me, like you've said that exact speech that you just gave one million times. <laughs> it sounds to me like you've said it forever. Because before, it's like, yeah, you know, whatever, I'm Zulai Kapital. You know, here we are, we're ready for the podcast. I asked you the question and you went rigid. You were like, well, um, uh, racism is, uh, from, from this perspective, it sounds like a speech you've practiced in your no, head. No, 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 it's not that. It's because um, it's something that I'm used to engaging in. Mm. And so, um, especially having gone to... To a historically white, white, white only school like Girls High, historically was a white only school, and so I found myself constantly having these conversations and constantly ironing out one definition. Like mm. it was always being tabled. It was always being tabled. Like, and one of the things that was always being tabled, which um, because there's a there's a, there was also a very interesting dynamic in not just it being a historically white only school but it also being a same sex school there's another a layer to it but back to the definition and then when you talk on an institutional on an institutional level institute it's institutions which are sanctioned by the state that uphold that uphold um pillars of structural racism institutions that have their own policies which um which um are racist policies which stem from the structural dynamics and the systemic dynamics and then the systemic and structural dynamics are on a large scale when you look economically when you look at the list of ceos and you see white men on the list majority and you maybe here you'll see one black man or and then one black woman that's on a structural and systemic level and then when you also look at um when you look at the dynamics of the country as well like from the geospatial divide because we still we still live in in apartheid's construct we still very much live in it the fact that you have a railway or a highway that separates an affluent community from a um, a township or a um, or a informal settlement community, and so one thing when I said this was a definition which was always being tabled was um, there was always the question of can black people be racist, and um, it always happened to be every time there would be a um, misunderstanding between. In all in all the times I remember having to explain this definition, it was there was always a misunderstanding between a black girl and a white girl, and um, a white girl would be like, "No, but you can't say that to me. You're being racist towards me." And I remember always being the person that said, "Black people don't have resources or means to be racist towards white people," and that's just something that I think needs to be understood from, especially looking at the root of of what racism is in this country that black people literally do not have those means and do not have the structure to even be racist what towards a white person because it's not a matter of hurting your feelings or um for example for example having a misunderstanding like we can be rude to each other hurt one another's feelings however when you talk about racism as a system black people do not have those means to run that system and it's never been a system that we've ever we've ever also upheld or built or run and it's not something that is that is um that has ever been upheld by us or built by us and also on top of that um racism is a system and not just a um not just a something that is exchanged over over um 
over simple conversations. It's a system which has brought about destruction and has taken countless lives. And so black people don't have the resources to be racist and can't be racist. Okay, we can so, hurt your okay, feelings. So, so hold on, let's talk about this. Because uh, I've, I've engaged on this topic a lot. Mm -hmm. So so let me ask you a, a, a basic question. So you say that, that black people can't be racist, white people can be racist. So does that mean that some of the things that white people do that are anti-black are not racist? And I'll now give you an example. So if, if I were to, let's say, um, I were to have an opportunity to, uh, to be friends with someone, right? So someone were to come up with, to me and say, hi, you know, um, introduce themselves. And I were to say, sorry, man, I don't want to be your friend. You're black. That's racist, right? We yes. can both agree that's racist. Yes. But if, if I were a black guy and a white guy were to come up and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, you know, this is my name. Introduce, same, same scenario, same place, same everything. And say, can I be your friend? And the black guy says, actually, man, I don't want to be your friend. You're white. Is that racist? See, see now, this is where, this is where I said we need to understand the power dynamics as to how, as to how um, things have looked in our society, which then makes it, which then makes it um, a situation of you can't necessarily say that's racist because you have to look at look at the root of the of of what racism okay, so, in the so country let's, is let's define and the look root. at let's say power we remove, dynamics. We remove the South African context. This is not in happening in South Africa. This is happening in. Uh, pff, trying to think of a country. Can't say USA as well. No, the USA has got or its the own, UK. like its own shit. Let's say somewhere in uh, somewhere in Africa, somewhere up north, right? Somewhere. Let's say uh, Cameroon. A friend of mine lives or used to live in Cameroon. It's a Cameroon, right? Cameroon is like ninety nine percent black people. It's a it's a black dominated society. That same scenario. But so is South Africa. Right. So, but not. I'm saying if this isn't happening in South South Africa. Let's say this is happening in a in Cameroon, right? Mm -hmm. Pop yourself in Cameroon or in a country, let's say, let's put it in a country where there are no white people and no black people. Let's say it's happening in the middle of uh, Japan. Okay, so white people don't have an advantage there, black people don't have an advantage there, it's equal playing field. Is it racist then? In that setup? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. How common is such a setup? Very rare. Very rare. It probably, it's never happened. Or maybe it's happened once or twice. And w the reason why I'm asking this question, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it's extremely rare, is because I'm trying to get to the core of a definition. Mm -hmm. Because if people who are debating this concept can't settle on a definition, then they, they, they can't go anywhere because they're having two different conversations. Mm -hmm. So regardless of how rare it is, in your opinion, as someone who's been fighting this battle for, for years, um, I mean, the better part of a decade... Would you say, we're in Japan, me and you, we're at a restaurant. I say to you, hey, saw you on Instagram, would love to be your friend. And you say to me, sorry, I don't want to be your friend, you're white. Is that racist? I've been in a setup such as this, actually. Okay. I've been in a setup such as this. And um, let me give you my response. Um, so I've been in a setup such as this, right? Um, honestly, to be honest, right? In high school... You never believe it, but I never actually had white friends in high school. Okay, which um, you don't say, huh? I could, I'd believe that. <laughs> okay, I think you, yeah, it's believable. Um, and not because I didn't want to, right? There was okay. Also, maybe I'm a bit of a bad example to use. Um, given that, um, because due to my entrance in high school and what took place into my entrance in high school, um they were always advised to keep their distance from me. But here and there, where I did make a friend or two, um, or rather make an acquaintance or two, um, and they approached me, my response at the time was, at the time was, I remember an acquaintance approaching me, started talking to me. Obviously, I'm quite talkative so obviously i went on with the conversation a couple of weeks passed and she's like so are we friends what are we and i was like we're acquaintances and then she was like what do you mean acquaintances why aren't we friends and i was like because i don't necessarily want you to tokenize me to be your trophy black friend hmm. and that's what i, I think, said to her and i actually think that's i hope that looking back on that now you you might think that that was a poor decision 
because what you what you had done so so let's let's put it in this situation and i understand the mm-hmm. the concept of having token black friends um and it happens you know mm-hmm. it's a thing that that happens all the time but i think that if you were to make a friend with someone who's very different from you uh, you know remove race mm-hmm. from it let's say mm-hmm. we were to have religious people christians and muslims if you as a christian were to have a muslim friend i think that opens up a really new it opens uh, up a, a very really big world for you because now to ex- if you to explore certain exactly, dynamics if you have, have someone that you respect and someone that you trust and someone that means a lot to you and they happen to have this this you know aspect of their life that's extremely different from yours um through conversation this person could could become someone who changes your mind and changes your life we see this all the time um with with sexuality yeah. People who have um, preconceived ideas about gay people, for example. Okay, so you've come from a really conservative household. You think that gay people are a certain way, and you make friends with someone who you don't know is gay. Mm-hmm. You make friends with someone, you know, you have a great time being their friend, and then somewhere down the line, you figure out that they are gay, and suddenly you're like, "Holy shit! This person is not at all what I thought gay people are like." Clearly, I'm wrong. Okay, clearly I need to challenge my ideas because this person isn't what I would expect from a gay person. So clearly I'm wrong. I think that that same, that same situation could be common in mm-hmm. relationships between, um, for example, white people and black people. So if you say to this person, I'm sorry, I don't want to be your friend because I don't want to be your token black person. What you're also saying is I'm not... I don't want to be the person to give you the opportunity to change your mind, which but is pretty. What happened was yes, I did continue with the acquaintance. It was like I was like, okay, um, I am just not someone who attaches a friendship label if it hasn't even been two months at least. We can be acquaintances, good acquaintances, and then um, after a month or so, we became friends, and then um, we we tabled a lot of a lot of. Um, a lot of uncomfortable conversations. Um, I think the first thing I asked her about, I asked about the land. Um, and we had conversations around that, had conversations around um, culture as well. Um, and then we, we, we had a lot of, a lot of conversations. I also learned a thing or two about, um, about like a lot that takes place in like um, shoes Afrikaans, Afrikaans culture. I learned a lot um, instead of just like labeling it as white culture. Like I specifically learned a thing or two um, about like some of the, some of the things that happen in terms of Afrikaans culture. So we had a lot of, um, a lot of broad conversations and um, there were times where we disagreed, but there was always, there was always a reminder, which I, which was always there that we can agree to disagree when it's not on the basis of, of um, we're agreeing to disagree on a system that places me and everyone that looks like me in a position of, 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 of essentially life and death, essentially, because racism has killed so many black people. So we can agree to disagree on anything, but we can't agree to disagree on such a destructive system. Point is the system is wrong and it has to be abolished, right? And that was the one thing we always agreed on. And yeah, it happened to be great whilst it it, it lasted. Obviously, the only reason why it, it ended was um, the end of high school. Mm. Okay, so, so I, I, but I back to of, your question, yeah. I think, I think, you know, I think in a way that would be, that would be a form of, 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 of discrimination, right? Um, but, but like I just from my own my own understanding of racism, which I've always used throughout all um all my my four to five years of of advocacy is that I wouldn't necessarily say that that is racism, right? And um, because anti blackness is just another because racism you have to think of it as sort of like sort of like think of think of a roof that has pillars and. On each each pillar, think of another thing that has come about because of racism, white supremacy, anti blackness, anti anti Asian anti Asian um, anti Asian discrimination, um, 
capitalism, capitalism is very closely linked to racism, um, especially in South Africa, just all of those pillars, right? And how that manifests through the st structurally, systemically, institutionally, interpersonal, internalized, right? And so because of, of um, the understanding I've, I've, I've come to get about racism, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's racism because like I said, it's a system that oppre that oppresses, that has oppressed and continues to oppress black people. And so I wouldn't say because of the power dynamic that would, that exists, right? Even till this day, I wouldn't say that would be racism, but I would say it would be a form of discrimination. Mm. And you're against discrimination as well in all forms. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do have white friends. I do. <laughs> Token white friends. No. No, no. No, I'm just saying it now because you said it wasn't surprising that when I said I didn't make a lot of white friends in high school. No, and they're my friends because they're my friends. Like yeah, I think I, they're pretty cool people. I think people that... People I can hang out with. The reason why I would, um, would have said that I'm not surprised that you didn't have a lot of white friends. There are two reasons. The first one is because I get the feeling... That a lot of your opinions, and I hope that this doesn't offend you, I get the feeling that many of your opinions have been formed in an echo chamber. So I feel as if a lot of your opinions have been formed by you saying something to someone who believes the same thing as you and they then saying it back. And, you know, within a closed room, these opinions are formed as opposed to being tested against people who, who disagree with you. But... You know, without um, without opportunity to to exit the conversation easily. So, for example, this podcast is a great example, right? So, we've got two hours. We've already been chatting for an hour and a half, or uh, for for half an hour, and you know, neither of us is going anywhere. We're here. So, in a situation where I'm screaming at you and you're screaming at me, and we're out in the street. It's it's very easy for us to get lost because there are other people who are going to be chipping in their mm -hmm. their two cents and it, you know it's just not going to go anywhere constructive. But here we've got an opportunity for a really constructive platform. Mm -hmm. So I I would actually love to see as I sort of try and test some of your opinions and you try and test some of mine over the next hour and a half just to sort of see how how you respond to that as well. So. The echo ch chamber thing is one one aspect of it, and then the second aspect is um, you're not a very agreeable person, which is not an an insult at all. Mm -hmm. Agreeableness is is the degree to which someone is um, willing to just accept things the way they are versus rebel against the way that things are. And obviously, just based on who you are, you are a person who rebels against uh you know the status quo a lot you're not a person who takes things on va face value you're a person who challenges ideas um and by the way people who are less agreeable tend to be more successful so uh that is a compliment but i think because of that you would have encountered struggles with people because if someone who is a white person were to say something you don't agree with i feel like you'd be very likely to enter a conflict situation as opposed to letting it slide. You, would you say that that's true? I wouldn't necessarily call it conflict, but a challenging conversation yes. to yeah. table what what was said. And yeah, um, in terms of in terms of the echo chamber, um, the echo chamber thing. One thing um, was is like since grade one up until grade twelve, I went to um, schools that were diverse, where they were like they were white people and like multi multiracial schools right and um i was i i think um only in high school i became friendly i was just a bit shy in primary school i was a bit shy but i was always open to making friends um and i just made friends where i could make friends um because i was always open to just making friends with anyone that actually we would speak and we'd get along and click right and so in high school, I did not only not only did I struggle with my social circles with just um, like on a broader scale in terms of like um, the whole issue of um, many white people being skeptical of making friends with me. But in general, on a broad scale, all like my socializing was affected, given that my entrance, my entrance into high school came with a really, really large, large um large movement which um a lot of people took differently and a lot of people painted p 
peop- the people that were involved in very different lights, right? Mm. And we were always seen as troublesome, threatening, um, um, anything attached to troublesome and, and threatening along those lines. And so it wasn't just my social, my social interactions with just white people that were affected, but more so those that more so those were just affected more than just my generalized mm. interactions. Of course, I, 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 that makes sense. Mm. So, okay, let's talk about a couple of things. So firstly, I, I noticed earlier when you were talking about um, different forms of, of hate across the world, you said racism, and then you said anti-Asian discrimination, mm. which I would call racism. Yes, yes. Would you call that yes. racism? Yes. So, okay, so that's interesting. So, uh, so... If if a who this is a lack of one. So if a if a black person were to hate an Asian because they are Asian, is that racism? In 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 terms of hating because yeah. they're Asian. Yeah. Yes. So so black people can be racist, just not towards white people. No, no, no. That's that's taking out that's taking what I said out of context, right? Okay, so let's put it into context. So so we've we've already had this discussion where we said you said that black people can't be racist because racist is a system. Racist mm. is uh, racism has a lot of uh, context behind it. It has a lot of oppression behind it. So now, if an Asian with oppression, which has still adapted yeah. into into today's society, right? Yes. Which was why I brought up um, I brought up anti blackness and anti anti Asian anti-Asian discrimination rights, which um, we've seen a lot of in now the US, with yes. the pandemic, right? Yeah. Um, not just in the US, like the whole thing of people saying, oh, no, it's not coronavirus, it's um, Chinese virus, you know, mm. which is which is discrimination, right? And so what I'm going to say is, is that um, the thing about racism, which is what gets me as to why I say groups that are marginalized economically and um, on a systemic level can't be racist. That, that's why I wouldn't like necessarily say that that is racism, but it's discrimination, which um, the root of that discrimination comes from the larger system of racism. Okay, so I think, I think we're I, actually... Am I, am yeah, I, cl- I think we're cl- getting somewhere because I'm now... Clarifying it? I'm, I'm sort of coming at this from a few different angles and I think we're mm. getting somewhere. So, so you're saying... You ought to think of racism as the root as the root which is it's 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 bigger than what we think it is it's a machine it's a machine that has an engine every machine that ha- every machine that exists has an engine which is where it starts right mm. and the engine that starting point is what keeps it running right and a machine has people that build it as well as people that continue to maintain it, that dr- drivers of it. And then mm. there's panels on the machine that hold the machine together and ensure the the, the constant um, existence of that machine because they're holding it together. Now think of think of anti blackness. Think of think of um of 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 anti anti Asian discrimination as those panels that continue to hold it together because it's um it continues and allows the existence of discrimination on the basis of 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 race and ethnicity in it it allows for its existence in society Mm. think of those as panels right panels which which um form part of this bigger system at hand but are not the engine but they are the panels okay so so who is the system benefiting because I feel like the automatic answer to that question is white people. Yes. White people are benefiting from the system. But now, let, let me go back to my previous question. If if a black person is benefiting from this machine, does that mean that In this black... Sense? So Okay, so we'll go Do back to... Do you want to, to talk the, about if black privilege exists as opposed to white privilege? We can get to that. Okay. We definitely can. But right now, I want to talk about the question that I had previously, which is if... Same situation that we discussed earlier, but... or or. In fact, remove our previous example. We'll just go straight to the U.S. right now, which is what's happening in the U.S. is that Asian people are getting um, attacked, I mean, killed in some cases. There's mm-hmm. a lot of racism towards Asian people. Mm-hmm. And the the people who are committing these acts of racism come from all races or, mm-hmm. you know, all of the races that are, that are predominant in the U.S. So there's a lot of black people in the U.S. I think they make up like 14, 15 percent. There's a lot of white people. There's a lot of Hispanic people in the U.S., all of them, or you know, some 
individuals from all of these groups are, are being racist towards Asians. So if a white person hates an Asian person because they are Asian, is that racist? Just yes or no? Yes. Okay, if a Hispanic person hates an Asian because they're Asian, is that racist? This is what I said. This is why I said no. Is because oh. it's be, no, 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 no. Listen, it's not because we're not getting anywhere. Mm. It's because this is why I brought up the example of the machine, right? Mm. This is why I brought up the example of the machine and why I explained um, systemic and structural racism and why I spoke of the power dynamic. The mm. power dynamic is very important because that that actually determines whether it is on whether it is racist or not. And okay, now, when so, you think so, of the example of of um, America, when you think of that, structurally, power pr power predominantly has been in the hands of white people, right? Mm. From the policing system to many other other um, facets of society, and which is why I said that it it's it's it it can't be racist, right? Because of the power dynamic. And now, if someone doesn't have doesn't have power, doesn't have power, then it doesn't make it, um, it doesn't, it doesn't make it, it, um, racism, but rather discrimination because of, um, the power, the power dynamic thing, right? And so if it comes from a person who is equally marginalized and doesn't have power, doesn't have economic power, doesn't have resource power, doesn't have, um, decision-making power as well, right? Then I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's racist, but it's discrimination, Right? So, so does discrimination that, okay. that stems from so, from racism. I'm actually so glad you've said that because now you've said that if you so discrimination from a person who has power to a person who doesn't have power, that is racism. Discrimination from a person who doesn't have power to a person who doesn't have power, that's just prejudice. Okay? Prejudice, hate, and discrimination. Right. So, who has power? Who are the groups of people? Because we could go through globally, a, globally. a long list of all the different races, but I'm sure there's only one, which is white people, it's right? Obvious. White male figures in particular, to be specific, and to add another layer to it, then you'd say heterosexual white men, to add another layer to it. Okay. So uh, I find this quite interesting. So on the way here, I was listening to a podcast. I was listening to a debate. I always like to, to prepare myself for things like this. Um, I, had a, I had a podcast with an LGBTQ representative a few months ago or probably about a month ago and again I was listening to I was consuming as much content as I could about around the topic and then a month later I had a podcast with a, a CEO of a cannabis company so I was making sure that I just consumed as much information about cannabis as possible oh I thought you were going to say as much I consumed, as, <laughs> consumed much as much cannabis as I got baked in preparation <laughs> um, no so uh, I, I obviously listened to a lot about this so it's. I'm, I kind of want to segue into this, without making it seem like I'm. I'm using this an ex, as an excuse, but the balance of of power has shifted a lot over the course of human history, right? So there have been times when uh, white people were certainly not at the top of the pecking order. White people were slaves to um, Romans for a long time. You know, Romans who are predominantly mm. um, Latin people. They white people were slaves to them for a very long time, and then the balance shifted where Africa came into the mix. There's a book I I wonder if you've read it. It's called uh, Racism: A Brief History. Um, I've read the blurb and just the first the first chapter only. I think you should probably read more than the blurb and the first <laughs> chapter because it's very yes. it's uh, it's very interesting and it it talks about this. Mm -hmm. It talks about how balance of power between races has has shifted, um, and. Uh, Africa, when Africa first came into the fold, uh, I mean, so so Egypt has been a big player in the global economy for a very long time, thousands of years. So if you... Centuries, in fact, because that was like also the starting point of ma mathematics. Yes, so thousands of years is more than centuries. So it's uh, a very, very long time that Egypt has been a player, but uh, people who came from, um, you know, very dark-skinned people, came from places like Nigeria and so on, were quite rare in the ancient world. They didn't really partake in uh, European... Rare because they were not documented? It's or possible. Or rare? Or rare, like, because I, I, I'm of the belief and I, I have to detest this one of they were rare. They, were, they weren't they were rare. They were present fully and their existence was present, mm. but they were not documented and it was deliberately, it was a deliberate colonial erasure. 
But you have to remember, if we look back at a place like ancient Greece, ancient Greece had people of all races represented. And there was uh, racism didn't exist there. It was not a thing yet. Let's talk about Timbuktu. Timbuktu and um, Mansa, Mansa Musa, and um, the which was taking place in Mali in West Africa. They they were the first university where the first university was built. That was a present role being played in our history. Mm. And so I I have to have to have to detest that that um, that that notion of that they. They they weren't they were rare because I'm 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 really strongly of the belief that they were fully present mm. but were deliberately erased. Okay, so I th I think we're having documented. two different conversations. When I say that they were rare, what I'm trying to say is they mm. were rare in Europe, because what I'm getting to is sort of so, the, the initial history behind where slavery came from and so on. So, uh, so the f do you know where the first forms of slavery existed? In terms of okay, slavery, people selling other people yes. for labor that ancient, came from, ancient Rome and, and so it, it's a concept that came from the Middle East. Mm. So when there were when there were slaves in the Middle East, it was just Middle Easterns enslaving other Middle Easterns. You know, it was um, people from what was once called Arabia. Those areas, yes, they yes, were enslaving in one another. Yes. It was a class thing. You know, extremely poor people could be sold or sold off as slaves. This concept was then adopted by the Romans. They had slaves, slaves of all colored uh, colors. Roman slaves, um, you know, black slaves, slaves from all over the world, Latin slaves, whatever. And um, over time, the sla the reason why today, when we think about slavery, we think about black people, that idea comes from the U.S. And the reason why it comes from the U.S. is because. Africans actually sold other Africans into slavery. Yes, yes. And they sent them to the U.S. And before before anyone knew it, the U.S. slave market was flooded with black people, and so black people became synonymous with slavery over time. However, we can't we can't take away the violence the violence that occurred through um through the 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 arrival the arrival of white men onto onto um and the invasion that the violent invasion that did take place as much as yes yes there was there was a a part where um where african african um monarchs played a role in um in selling in selling people to um to and making deals with with white settlers however um what we also can't erase was the violence and the violent invasion that did occur through um, the arrival of white settlers. You're talking about the scramble of Africa and the colonial history. Yes. So reference to that. Yeah. So we've got a couple different. I think there's a there's a bit of an issue in terms of timeline right now. So this. Which timeline are we in? The timeline of Earth's are history. Are you in? <laughs> so that, I'm in the 1800s. Right. right so now. you are way far ahead. So the scramble for Africa and the African the colonialization of the African continent. Uh, continent. This was relatively recent in terms of the history of slavery. Slavery's history goes back but long before, before that. There were slaves in the BC. You yes, know, there yes. were slaves very, very long ago. Far, be and this is why I say that um, African people, people from Africa, apart from people who were right there by the mm -hmm. Red Sea, apart from them. That, that's why I'm saying African people were rare. Because at that point, Africa was very much still undiscovered by people in the Undis North, people in the West. But then, I, um, this, is, this is the part where language plays a very big role. Because language is, how, is, what, um, is what is used to document history, right? Mm. And language plays a role in the erasure of history. And the type of language we use is very, very important, right? And this is where I want to challenge you to find to find different words other than undiscovered because you can't discover a place that already exists and a place that already has its own set of values, cultural norms, and is already there's already human life there which is not just is not just stagnant but is thriving, is building. Timbuktu is happening, many other things are happening in different parts of Africa. You can't discover a place that already exists and has it 
and has her people and its own cultural norms and um, value systems and systems which are being built, right? And humanity is essentially mm. is essentially doing the natural thing where people are people are living, people are born, people grow up, people build, um, um, and 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 um, homes are built and and more so communities are being built, nations are being built, nations are being are being trained, and so you can't discover a place that already exists. I want to challenge you. To find um, a different a different word because that then the, the the term Africa was pretty much undiscovered perpetuates the erasure the erasure of um, of ancient African history which um, in which which basically is um, is that the fact that um, there was there was life going on in in simple terms there was life going on mm. on the african continent before the arrival of the white settlers right so, so did you, i want to challenge you to find yes. another term did you did you listen to the end of my sentence yes you, you said pretty speaking? much undiscovered at the time by by westerners and people in the north as well but I this said. is undiscovered by the The thing that i'm saying is that you can't discover what something that already exists well i'd argue that you can only discover something that already exists because you couldn't uh, if you if something did not yet exist then there would be nothing to discover Then i want to challenge you i want to challenge you and say if you if if you say that they discovered then if you say that they discovered then it makes it their arrival their arrival innocent and sweet and you can't take away the violence of their arrival okay when when the people who we now today know as the causas and the zulus they mm. came down from northern africa and they eventually moved into southern africa yes there was migration yes exactly that's what was, i mean by there was life happening on right the continent. okay cool so um we've got the only people who are truly indigenous to south africa are the are the khoisan right so we've got this sun this people, group of yes. uh, this group of sun people so now a group of people from Nigeria moved down. Would you would you say that they discovered the sun here? No, I wouldn't say they discovered. You wouldn't say because there was they, a lot of bloodshed there too. Yes, there was. There was. There was. There was a lot of um, bloodshed amongst different African tribes yes. through um, through the migration that was taking place and so migration. That I was, think that 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 if we were to open pop open a dictionary. Discovery just means to find something that you did not know was there before. I can discover something in my garden or in but my house. I, I can lift say, up a book and discover a spider. Dis- I wouldn't say it was discovery. It wasn't discovery. There, okay. There's a perfect term I already for I, I really own. do think that I get where you're coming from because you don't want it to sound as if Africa was this dark, stagnant place, and the rest of the world was bustling and moving. And then, hurrah, we found this. We found this place. I get that. That's where you. No, no, from. no. That's what, not what I'm saying. I'm I'm challenging you to find a different term other than discover, because with that, there's already its own. There's a word already. Migration. They migrated downwards. They migrated downwards, downwards, and invaded invaded a tribe that was already there and what happened then there was bloodshed and war right mm. and then what then again happened was more migration into into um different in different directions of the south right the so west, so what if i east. were to say that uh, if i were to say that uh that that dutch people and french people migrated into south africa would you be happy no. with that term? No, <laughs> no, they couldn't have. They couldn't have migrated. Why they not? They couldn't have migrated. They couldn't have my. They couldn't have migrated. They couldn't have migrated because their arrival came didn't come. It, their arrival was not the same. You can't say their arrival was the same as the Zulus and the Kosas when they came downwards, right? It was not the same kind of arrival. Their arrival was violent. Their arrival was violent on everyone that was already living and their their arrival was more of conquest than to conquer mm. but okay <laughs> okay hold on i'm challenging no, you to find a different okay term, so cause... hold on i'm i'm this is interesting so okay so we've got two scenarios scenario a a group of black african people who live in what we now call nigeria they came down as a group Okay, they came down into southern Africa in search of new lands. As a tribe. As tribe a tribe, is a right? Okay, group. tribe. 
So their tribe came down. They, they were in search of new lands. There's much history there. Um, Prof. Cooper at the University of Pretoria, he loves this stuff. He would have a long chat with you about it. He's very into the tribal history of Africa. So he uh, also, so this tribe of people from um, Nigeria, they come down. They're in search of new land. They rock up in South Africa, or what we now call South Africa. Rhodesia um, was what it was called back in the day. Zimbabwe, we call it today. They rock up in this area. They find the indigenous people who are the sun. They killed many of them. There was a very, there was a Those blood violent, bath, blood violent situation. And they took over the area. They, they separated after some time and built their own tribes and blah, blah, blah. So that's migration. Yes? That's what you've said. Migration is the trip that they were taking. Okay, so what do you call it when they arrive? When they arrive. Because that's a conquest, right? Yes. They've, okay. And then when the Dutch people and the French, uh, what's the word? Higenuete in Afrikaans. I don't know what it is in English. These people came down in when their they, boats. Oh, yeah, when they sailed they down. They sailed down. They rocked up at what we call Cape Town. They set up a thing. They encountered local people. They killed them. There was much bloodshed. And eventually they took much of the land for themselves. That's different, you're saying. No, that's conquest. However... Specifically, now let's specify. Let's specify. Yeah. Let's let's now specify. The one was tribe tri um, tribal conquest, right? Mm. Because it was happening amongst tribes, right? Yes. And um, through one tribe migrating downwards, conquering the land of the tribe that was um, that was living there, right? Mm. And so then the one is colonial conquest because it involved it involved. Col the colonization of the entire area. So you would say that... So, hold on. It, I mean... No, I'm drawing a, the a specifications. Tribe, a tribe, uh, by definition, a tribe is just a group of people who associate to to the same flag. You know? A uh, I could, South Africa be, could be a tribe. Yeah. The British could be a tribe. Um, you know? And uh, tribe is just a word that we... Uh, tribalism for example, is a concept that isn't associated to any race or any culture or whatever, despite the yeah, fact it's that... It's associated between um, the discrimination from one tribe onto another. Exactly. Tribe, right? Which was also fueled by, um, by when you look at it historically, how, it, how tribalism... But we're not there yet in this discussion, yeah. but interesting point is that how tribalism was fueled was through the Group Areas Act. And through the harsh separation of why why um, the harsh separation that the apartheid regime enforced in separating not just people according to race but separating people according to um, cultural and tribal tribal um, and tribes. Okay. So uh, anyway, let's anyway, get yeah. so back so to this. When we talk about the tribe of people from Nigeria coming down, conquering the land, taking the land, killing the natives. You're like that's that's fine. That's Nate. good by you. No, 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 no. So no, you no. don't feel like in history no one should ever have gone to another person's place and taken it over. That's not a thing that should have happened. Is do is that your standpoint? No, that no, 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 no. That's not my standpoint. That's not my standpoint. And you're also changing where we're at with this discussion. Where we're at is naming the two and separating the two, which then also becomes because the Dutch and the French, um, their con their their conquest was was very violent. Was very was even harsher than harsher than the tribe the tribe the tribal conquest of the um, Zulus and um, now known today as the Zulus and the Kasas onto um onto the the indigenous san and khoisan people at the time right the 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 um the conquest of the um dutch and french was more harsh and violent because it ended up essentially it ended up becoming colonization of the entire area right and so so, so you are using success of the colonization as a measure of violence no i'm not using success i'm not using success i'm using I'm measuring. Um, I'm measuring the amount of violence. Okay. And I, I have in another... measuring the amount of violence, I'm thinking beyond just that time because obviously it continued to span over, which then led to the the, the formation of um, the Dutch the Dutch colony the Dutch colony, and eventually led to the 
colonization of the area which then also um led to the 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 mass what i define this as more more not just bloodshed but genocide of of um of the indigenous people led to um to um the the like more of, it was more harsh and violent the but, mass killings of people and taking over the entire area and also culturally erasing what was already there and mm. also taking you know away what, culture Zuleika, you know what but, i find in, just hold on i want to make a point so mm. you know what i find interesting so when the, there are very very few sun people left today um, there are a small pool of people. When when this tribe from Nigeria came down and conquered what we now call South Africa, they very nearly erased the sun. I mean, no. they they killed most of them. This is a fact. I have to detest that one. Okay. More of that. More of 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 the the killings, the killings of of indigenous, the indigenous um the indigenous people, the sun, and because I I do believe that not much there's not much um that's been documented and so we just know the sign because that's who we were taught about but we weren't necessarily taught in detail as to more detail of um of the the the, the culture as a whole right and um the people as a whole right so when i say um the the indigenous people you know um who uh, who i'm talking about right and so um more of that took place under under the the dutch the Dutch, the Dutch conquest through the this the forceful the forceful setup of the of the Dutch colony, which led to them fir at first colonizing what we now today known as the Western Cape, the whole Western Cape spanning into the Eastern Cape, right? That most of it took place through that, because we can. This is one thing that I refuse to take away is the violence that came with the arrival of white settlers mm. when they arrived at the the cape point the cape point cape town cape point but that point on the cape right it was not a it was not a a, a friendly arrival of hi neighbor how you doing neighbor i'm from mm. the other side of the ocean right it was it was a violent arrival which involved killing violent genocides took place raping stealing torture mm. and so and and colonizing the entire area but i mean if if you look at human history as a whole mm. in raping and pillaging and stealing and yes. conquest it's it's a part of who we are as a people like now we're 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 advanced we're modernized and this we don't do that anymore uh, you know at least most of us don't do that anymore but i mean back in the day the people who we called the vikings they had you know, clans, yes. tribes. They had groups of people who c conquested one another, small islands, they took each other over, they conquered new land in all white people. Then if you go to the Middle East, you had, um, you know, big bands of people who fought one another and, you know, took over and stole and destroyed cultures and, and wiped things out. Um, even the, the great, like, the great empires of the world mm. sometimes broke into two and then attacked each other and mm. they they ended up entirely destroying themselves in the process so it's in a, it's an important part of who who we were mm. as a, as a race as a as a human race but i think that to to say that to say that when the nigerian tribe came down conquered violent genocide stole took land from the Khoisan who were already here and nearly wiped them out compared to when the Dutch came down, stole, destroyed, killed, genocide, the people who were here. I think that you need to hold those two events as equal in mm -hmm. weight because you, you're shaking my reasoning, your head. My reasoning as to why you can't hold those two equal, ha equal in hand, right? Mm -hmm. You need to look at what... What was the aftermath? What was the continuation, right? Okay, so what was I would the so so let's let's quickly answer that. I would say that the Khoisan hold very very little power in South Africa today. Would you agree? True. Agreed. So you would say however, that the initial conquest however, no. by that Nigerian tribe was remarkably successful in oppressing the Khoisan. However, 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 this is where I think that <laughs> I think that you you you're shying away from here. However, you have to look at the aftermath. What was the aftermath of the arrival of the Dutch? The aftermath was colonization, setting up of the, the forceful. Well, it wasn't something that was that became a signed deal. It was forceful. Mm. It was forceful, which um, 
which in which they set up the the Dutch the Dutch colony mm. in um the area of um the Western Cape spanning into um those Transol, parts of of, those of the places, of yes. the Eastern Cape, which yes. we now know as those areas of Grahamstown, where you have the Sarapartman district in Grahamstown, yes. um, going into into that those those areas of the Eastern Cape. That's yeah. how and what then happened. What continued to happen from that colonization, that setting up of that colony. What was the continued aftermath? The continued aftermath was a continued forceful forceful white rule and. Mm. Um, started to become the beginning of white domination in the country, okay. which then led to um, led to more um, more 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 forceful forceful um, forceful conquests, and then also there was the the um, there was also the 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 clash between the English and the the English settlers and the mm. Dutch settlers yes. won't take that away. Um, that is also a part of an important part of our history because then what then became the country South Africa became a colony of the English because mm. then there was an involvement of yes. the English settlers. My, my forefathers, my ancestors were and in then, concentration camps. And then the the English the English going on to um to go go into um into the um essentially oppressing the Dutch settlers, mm. right? Um, and then after that, handing over the country to them and they, then that then came the apartheid system. And so the reason why I would not hold those two equal, why I would not hold those two equal is because of what continued to manifest after mm. the conquest. Okay, I, I think it's interesting. And and what was the constant build-up? So, so what I think, if I if I were to, to reason this for myself... And I would try and figure this out. What I would say is, okay, cool. If I'm going to now agree with Zulaika and, and follow Zulaika's point of logic um, and, you know, the way you're looking at this is saying that the reason why the, the Dutch conquest of South Africa is way worse is because now, many, many years later, there are still a lot of problems as a result of that, like, you know, black people are still not adequately represented in, in the economic space. Black people are still not adequately represented in the social racism space. Still attached racism to, still to the, country, the whole thing. The foundation of but the if, country. if I were to look at my example of this group of Nigerians, tribe of Nigerians coming, not wait, Nigerians, they, you, they are Nigerians now, but they weren't then, coming down and taking over, like we can very clearly, the, the proof is in the pudding. How many sun people do you know? Because I don't know any no, sound no, people, no, no, no. and I think this is that... where you're taking it away. This is where you're taking it away. This is where you're taking it back. This is completely now you're shifting it back to where we started with I, this I'm trying conversation. To, what I'm trying to explain to you is, is why I the think migration that the, coming the, down. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say is why I think those two scenarios are very similar, could be compared, and could be used as a as a study of human nature is because i'm saying that conquest a from north africa down into south africa northwest i mean if you broke them down into the break break it down into basic basic terms group a comes into the space of group b destroys group b takes over the but land but doesn't fully destroy group b cuz but if did, group would b you was say that dutch destroyed. people fully destroyed Zulu and Kosa and Sutu, because I know a lot of Zulu and Kosa and Sutu people. I don't know any Sun people. So what I no, would but argue now, now you're changing it. This is where <laughs> I, my argument comes in. My argument comes in into into when group now let's see group C group C which comes with their ships. Their conquest brought about destruction amongst everyone. Like mm. now there's a ripple effect, like yes. domino effect, like one down everything goes down, right? Yeah. Theirs, that's why I say theirs was more violent. And when you say you don't know a, a single um, person from today from um, the indigenous the indigenous tribe of San people, Khoisan people, you can't say that was only primarily because of tribal tribal wars that took place through um, as a result of migration. Because what happened, what even happened after migration was violent colonization mm. by white settlers onto not just South Africa but the whole of the African continent. Mm. And it wasn't just it wasn't just the, the indigenous San and Khoisan people who were erased. Many other indigenous groups, the Nama people were also erased by the German 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 settlers, right? Erased through genocide, gen mm. a, a harsh, violent genocide, right? And so and so what I'm saying is is that you can't 
compare the intensity of of the of the to the vi and the violence and the form of the violence as well you can't hold the, the two equal you just can't because even even in the tribal wars in the during the with the tribal the tribal wars that um took place as a result of migration right the violence was not the same as the violence that happened through colonization because the violence of colonization is still existent till this day today and the violence of colonization was one of the primary for me one of the primary primary um primary reasons of for the the genocide of um indigenous people which is why you don't know much and you have such a small um minority group today right mm. because of because because of the whole um the whole um the whole setup of the dutch the dutch colony the um you know the different stories of um the different the different stories of um different different people whose names we know in history who were documented from kortowa to sarah partman those are examples of how of how the the dutch settlers the dutch settlers played a massive violent role in um in the killing of of indigenous mm. people i wonder if i if i could trans if i could go back in history and just take the all both my of us. all my podcast equipment with me and i could go back to 1650 2 years 1652. before no 1650, 1650 2 years before, before there were any before settlers here exactly if i could go back to 1650 and I sat down in a hut and I had a chat with a, a, a sign person. And I was saying to them, tell me a little bit about how you feel about your history. I wonder if they would also say to me, there was a terrible violent conquest and these people who we don't know, they look different from us. They just rocked up here and they stole all our shit and they killed all our people. And it was terrible. But because I feel like it's a situation of history and Zuleika, you're great. I'm, a, I'm, I'm so glad to be sitting here talking to you, but I feel like it's a repeat of history. And the first time around, it was your people who were the perpetrators. It was your people who were the violent settlers and the colonizers, you know, if you would Colon want to use that word. <laughs> colonizer is a big term. It's okay, big so term. let's remove colonizer. Let's just say violent settlers, people who came in, stole, pillaged, took the land, took the area, claimed it set up their own society. I feel like it happened However, once also, and it also... happened again. And the second time, the latest time, it was, you know, it was my people. It was white people who rocked up here. And I feel like there's a fight to be had. But I also feel like to say that, to say that the previous time when it was the Khoi people who, the Khoisan people who were the victims and the people who formed the tribes that are here now today, like the Zulus and the Suzus, they were the aggressors. To say that that is not nearly as bad as what happened a couple of hundred years later with colonization, with colonization, I feel bad. like that's. Not, I, I feel like someone who who is Khoisan might say to you that that is extremely disrespectful. To say that what no. their culture went through at the hands of your culture is not nearly as bad as what your culture went through at the hands of mine. I feel like a, no, a Khoisan person might was, have a lot to say about I think, that. I think yes, I hear your point. I hear your point, right? I hear your point, but the reason why I'm saying that you can't hold the two and say they're exactly similar, they're exactly similar is because they, there's intersections in it that make the two differ, which was why I explained, which was why I explained the matter of um of colonization was across everyone. Colonization was across everyone, right? Um and it had its effects till this day. It's a, it's a violence is still existent till today. And what I'm not also saying is I'm not saying that tribalism didn't exist, right? And what I'm not saying is that it was not violent. It was not violent. The migration, the migration and the tribal wars that existed were violent, right? They were violent and they were bad, right? And they were terrible. Yes, you do, like. In general, as people, as human beings, as human beings who are conscious and aware, right? We obviously, we obviously, um, we we think bloodshed. We know bloodshed is 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 a bad thing, right? Mm. But what I'm saying is that you can't hold the two similar. The two are absolutely not similar at all. Okay. You can't uh, you can't hold colonization by European white settlers onto um because it wasn't even just South Africa only. 
the whole African continent in different parts by different different um different different groupings of um European settlers, the Belgian, the German, the French, the English, the Dutch. You can't hold it the same as tribe tribal tribal wars that took place within the African continent amongst tribes whilst migration migration took place. It's not the same because it its effects were different. Its effects differ largely, right? Mm -hmm. The um yes, okay, it was very violent. However, the intensity of the violence also differs. Also differs, right? It also differs because the settlers came with guns as well. Mm. The settlers came with guns. Settlers... Would you say that a gun is less violent than a spear? Because I have <laughs> no. some news for you, Zuleika. Have you ever seen something killed with a spear? Yes, yes. That is yes. a hectic, okay. violent, painful, Maybe that is a bad death. example. However, the intensity where I'm going with the violence is, is I'm looking at a large scale violence, right? The intensity of the violence also differs. And I'm not taking away the, um, the experience, the experience, the individual experiences within and the atrocities that happened within tribal wars. I'm not dis discrediting those and taking those away. However, I'm saying that what we cannot do is hold the two equally the same and say that they were exactly mm. the same and it's a mere repeat of history you can't do that this is why intersectionality is very important because there are different layers that separate the two largely okay i, I mean i don't want to i don't want to spend the whole podcast talking about definitions i want to ask you a question it's not definitions it's intersectionality intersectionality and though. layers how how much how much so so often time when people sit down to debate these sorts of things they can never agree you know it's like they can never find common ground and it's it's kind of difficult to to gain traction and and to really gain a solution in a in a debate around this topic how much of that do you think comes from um things like definition and things like nuance because i mean mm. when we started talking we spoke about for example racism and can black people be racist can mm. you know how does that work I mean, it took us a good half an hour to get nowhere because we still don't have a we still don't have a a solid definition of of what exactly racism is and in what scenarios it can it can be applicable, right? How much of the fact that you can really use a word in a way that's applicable to your argument then? How much you know? Do you think that struggle around definition contributes to the fact that people just can't agree on this topic? I think it contributes a lot. I think it contributes a lot because far too many times these experiences which you can't exactly put a word onto, you can't exactly put a word onto. However, it's an experience that is felt internally and it's an experience that you can see, right? And so I do think that that plays a role, which is why I also specified to you that language is very important and the... um. <clears throat> And the, the manner in which we use language as well when we were just debating um, the word discover, right? And so that plays a role in, um, in not, it plays a role in, 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 in um, the debates at large as well as, um, as well as talking about the issue as well, right? And um, it, it, it does play a role because the, you, you're unable due to experience at times one that has experienced will find themselves unable to articulate the experience the experience with a specific word however through narrating the personal experience you can come to a, a better understanding pretty pretty much do you want me to go deeper yeah go deeper go we've got time because because what i'm saying is what i'm saying with words right with words for example it's difficult it's difficult to use a single word to pinpoint an experience an experience which an experience which um for example let's talk about let's talk about um um i'm trying to think of an example i'm trying to think of an example um an example which doesn't have a word attached to it talk about talk about actually yes 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 talk about the internal talk about internalized internalized racism right when there isn't a specific word to say there isn't a specific word other than saying 
racism but there isn't a word to go deeper with you have to narrate the experience when we speak of internalized racism and you it talk about when you unpack internalized racism you see it leads you to unpacking deeper which then is essentially narrating the experience when you talk about for example um how you I, i'll take an experience of mine um i've number of times walked into walked into into um into a store into a store and then um walked in and um and stood stood near a white person and they moved further away from me because i'm black right i don't and to be honest i don't think it was because you're black i think it's not because well of COVID I, right obviously now. i wasn't there no no, no no i personally if i'm standing in a store and someone comes and stands right next to me I'm going to walk away. It doesn't matter who no, they are. No, it doesn't no. matter I'm what they look about, like. I'm talking about now. You see, I just, I, I didn't explain the, 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 the scenario in detail. Didn't mm-hmm. explain the scenario in detail. Obviously, there's a kind of, there's a kind of body, body language. There's a kind of body language which indicates and determines why you're moving away from me. The kind of body language which you express towards me. The kind of eye contact which you show me in how you're looking at me. Mm. that plays a role in determining that you moved away from me because i'm not white right and then there's also experiences of um experiences of of um more so this happens with black boys and black men right where for example a white woman will hold her purse tighter or hold her bag tighter when she's in the presence of a black man or a black boy right because she's been conditioned by racism um and been conditioned by 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 racist ideology that a black man is a thug right when that 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 is wrong and der- and 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 racist and derogatory and in all its forms right and when you talk of experiences like that right and you have discussions such as that right that then leads you to narrating the experience and unpacking the experience because you can't exactly pinpoint one word on it mm. right which is then Zuleika, you know what I think would be so valuable, and what uh, we'll we'll probably never see it in our lifetimes. But if we if we did, I would love to to meet up with you and and try this experiment. So think about consciousness, the idea behind consciousness and and who we are as people. If there was a way for you and I to swap consciousness for a day, and for or for a week, and I'm now in the body of of this young black woman, and you're in the body of this Afrikaans guy. And we were to just go about our everyday lives and go to the places we usually go to and do the things we usually do. I wonder, I wonder how much our perspective would change. Because on my side, I feel like there's a lot of things that I would say. The a lot experience of that you wouldn't have necessarily seen and experienced that you will experience. Yeah, I think. Of, I think so. So let me finish. A lot of so, subtle violence. I think that what I would, what I would expect from that experience is I would probably encounter a lot of the things that you tell me that you experience and it would it would bring to me new new perspective and new light on the experience of how it feels to be a black person in communities and and in spaces but I also have to say I feel like you would in my body walking around doing things that you usually do I find that or I, I wonder whether you would experience a lot of the same stuff and then think to yourself, maybe it isn't because I'm black. Maybe it's because it's human nature. So I'll give you an example. I think, uh, I definitely think that there's something to be said for a woman clutching her purse more tightly um, when a black man walks into a room. But I also know that women clutch their purses more tightly when someone substantially larger than them walks into the room. It has happened with me. If I'm if if I walk into a room and there's a woman there and she's very small and she sees me, it's the, you get scared, you get defensive, you move away from that space if you're very small. I wonder if you would, in my body, walk into a shop, notice the same thing happen, and think maybe it wasn't because I was black. Maybe it was because People are afraid of people who are larger than they are. People are afraid of people who are intimidating, or maybe even people, people are, are afraid of to people. Be ap- afraid of people, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, so this is the really unfortunate thing that, as much as that, if possible, would be would be great to 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 um to widen perspective. However, however, 
it's there are dynamics that just don't allow for us to like just let it slide and say maybe it's because it's human nature and because um because um people are afraid of people who are larger than them you can't mm. you can't erase that people have been conditioned and been taught to be afraid of other people of other of other people because of race and because of skin tone and skin color mm. you can't you can't erase that and that's just the unfortunate thing of such a scenario that you just can't erase that because you take away um you take away centuries of pain and torture through that and just the simple the subtle the subtle violence experience the very subtle violence experienced by a black person by a black person in in white dominated spaces for example or just simply simply walking in in the country and what they experience around them and the interactions that come from that you it's the unfortunate thing of that example is that the world we live in just doesn't allow for you to simply say that it's just a matter of um of the fact that um we're humans and we're afraid of people bigger than us. Mm. Uh, so okay, so so let's pivot the conversation a little bit. I want to ask you a, a, a sort of big question. So you're in. You would would you describe what you have been doing for the better part of the last decade, the activism and so on. Would you describe that as a struggle? towards an eventual goal, right? You describe that as saying, I am trying to change the world and change it to be a certain way, right? Mm, yes. What does that victory look like to you? Like, in as much detail as possible, what happens, what does the world look like on the day Zulai Kapital says, we did it. Racism is no more. The world is as it should be. Okay, um, it would be very idealistic if I actually said I would be alive for that day. Um given how how deep of a of a and how large of a machine that we are we're trying to dismantle here it would be idealistic for me to say that I'd be alive till that day however however what i will say would be a victory is ensuring that um that let's say let's put let's put time frames on it 10 years from now 2031 society doesn't doesn't look like the way it looks now, right? It doesn't look the way it looks now. Policies don't look the way they look now. Policies that shouldn't exist don't exist then. Like what? Um, like what policies? For example, um, language policies in um, in schools in schools which are former Model C and former whites only schools, which prohibit prohibit children from con when they converse amongst themselves from speaking their own language because that was a policy that was one of the the rules we protested in girls high whereby as black girls we weren't allowed to speak our mother tongues amongst ourselves conversing i couldn't converse with a friend yeah that's in, bullshit is, in isndebe exactly okay so right? so, so let's so, talk about policies that still exist what policies, are the policies hair policies hair policies um we we at the time said that the mere existence of a hair policy allows room for discrimination because you're granting a minority minority of people usually usually always happens to be white the power over over um over over determining how others should um should express their constitutional right because identity is 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 spoken of in the constitution that every citizen has the right to um cultural and identity expression and you cannot take away hair from identity and culture right and so what we spoke about at the time and I'm going to take you back we said simple simple universal um regulations such as um for the sake of for the sake of even even at the time i remember we had conversations around challenging the idea of uniformity right where does uniformity st stem from however we said that's a bit very in terms of where where we at as a country it's um because you have to one thing i've noticed um is that you have to deal things with things step by step so we said okay in looking at the step that we need to climb now right what can we do right um which was the first immediate abolition of um of racist policies that directly discriminated against black hair such as the prohibition of afros dreadlocks um braids right that 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 in its own was the first immediate step that we had to climb right the second step that we had to climb was then um 
saying saying the mere existence of a hair policy allows room for discrimination there can never be a policy without discrimination in it someone is always going to be left out and so what we then began to say universal rule of you can't dye your hair you can't dye your hair obviously right and um should you decide to tie your hair or whatever it may be your the colors you use must be obviously in line with the uniform that you wear right mm. right and so speaking that's when i say men, when i mention policies such as those and i'm still till this day even after matriculating i'm still of the belief that the mere existence the mere existence given where we come from because i'm not someone who deals with surface level issue right i as a radical i believe that you ought to um grasp things from the root itself right and so um because I, I like I've never dealt with surface level. I've always been someone who dives into the root and goes further and continues to unpack and pick at the root, right? And so, um, in 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 such as policies that I mentioned, language policy, hair policy, and looking at syllabuses as well, Sibili syllabuses, and in, now I'm speaking about it from an education perspective, right? Because um, that's where my activism began in within the the um within the 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 confines of education, for example, or rather not confines, but within the arena of education, right? And so looking at it 10 years from now, let's say a simple 10-year victory that's to be achieved in 20, 2031, we should be in a country whereby a child is not um, held back from attending a school because of um, the texture of their hair or because they um, or because um, or because they are black and they have dreadlocks, they can't attend a certain school, right? They should not be held back from that. And a child should walk into a classroom where they can be taught a wide range of African languages as living in an African continent and not just be not just be bound to learning in English and Afrikaans. And then you talk from a syllabus perspective, right? Syllabus perspective whereby a child walks into a school and they're not just simply only only taught um, Shakespeare, but they are taught something more relatable to their reality, which has been held, which has been left out for a very long time. And they're taught a more Afrocentric, a more Afrocentric um, syllabus where they learn about um, the plays written by African African writers, and they learn about and they they um, unpack um, African novels by going from um, Chinua Achebe, Achebe um, Chimamanda, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Ben Okri and many other phenomenal, um, phenom phenomenal um, African writers, right? And then you look at, um, and then you talk about from an interpersonal level, the conversations that that generation has then should not look like the conversations that we're currently having, right? Um, for example, one thing I said as a feminist, right? I said that um, in 10 years to come, feminists in 10 years, that generation, right, should not be having the same conversations that my generation of feminists are having and that is a simple simple short-term um short-term victory and then when you go into a now longer like let's say 25 years then you talk of talk of land okay but this one has been pending for a very long time very very long time people should should be owning land there should people land should be should um should have been re-expropriated back to people it was stolen from right with that's the process that we should get get going because it's been it's been very very um stagnant for some time and it's just been something where we've been throwing around the term throwing around catchy phrase slogans and we haven't been getting anywhere right um, so so hold on so sorry sorry obviously, to you, sort in of... terms of years when we talk of that obviously the end goal is the elimination of of racial discrimination right however you deal with it in um in 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 parts right like for example in the usa um defunding the police right in south africa institutionalized racism in schools in education right and then you deal with it from also um a a a how the country is laid out a geospatial geospatial view when you look and you're like access access should change right access should change schools should be better where by a child in guiani should be able to access a quality school near them near home they shouldn't have to travel for hours in the in an ungodly hour to access a school in um the suburb of 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 Bulukwane, for example this is an example like same with um 
coming from Mamilodi and having to come to Pretoria, right? And so you have to deal with it in steps, right? And obviously the end goal would obviously be the er elimination of racial discrimination, but you deal with it in steps. Mm. Okay, so I want to talk about land. Uh, land, land. Is, land is a really interesting, really interesting topic to me. And something which, uh, you know, you have to, you have to kind of balance things out because first you need to decide what is the basis for for redistributing land? Like, where do we draw the line? And you also have to say, uh, you know, what's realistic, what's good for the economy, what's good for the people, blah, blah, blah. That You know, you still need to play around that. So let me ask you a question. So you say that we should redistribute land because land was stolen, right? So land was taken from people. And who... majority of the land till this day is still owned by white yes. men. Okay, so if we, if we want to... Like, let's go back to that previous example that I gave about the Khoisan. So if the Khoisan were the original okay, owners no, of I the know, land... I think I know where you're going. Yeah. Okay. Well, if the Khoisan were the original owners of the land, and the, let's say that there was a Khoisan family who for generations had lived in X, then, uh, you know, through this whole migration conquest, that land was taken over by a Zulu tribe, and then through um, Dutch coloniz colonialization or French colonialization, mm -hmm. that w land was taken by a French tribe... How far do we rewind the clock? Because if you want to then say, okay, well, we need to give this land back to the people they took it from, okay. surely then the people that were originally the owners of the land and who took it from nobody were the Khoisan people. Does okay, that make sense? Let's now deal with it. Now you want to deal with how far back we, sh we should go. Yes. Look at the present now. What's okay. happening in the present? The present is is that people are unemployed, right? People are unemployed and they can't access land for farming, com land for commercial farming, so that they can provide for themselves and their communities, right? Because majority of, of the, the land is still owned by white men. You drive past, when you take a road trip and you go down, the land you see on the sides, you see citrus farms, you see big farms, you see big commercial farms, majority of that land is owned, is in the hands of white men, right? Mm. And people don't have access to employment and people need land to farm, right? So then you also deal with housing. People don't have land to build um, housing. People don't have homes, right? Then you also deal with the issue of just now, just now, just now, 19, 19, 1913, um, the land... The Land Act, right, 1913, and then you go, um, you go more recent Group Areas Act, right? You deal with forceful removal, right? Forceful removal of just now. You go that far back, right? You go that far back, right? You go into the apartheid regime, the forceful removal, and um, the the land, the, the the Land Act, right? Group Areas Act, which was also which became the forceful removals, and then the Land Act, just recent just now right you deal with that whereby people have been forcefully displaced and they know where um where for example i always say this where their ancestors are buried right that's you deal with the now right that's where you begin the process right that's where you begin the process right and there has to be an accelerate and start into any process right you can't wait to for, to fully say let's question let's go far 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 back we need to deal with the now currently now people don't have land for housing they don't have land for housing simple thing housing mm -hmm. uh, okay wait stop, right. stop 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 so let's, Whoa, let's wait, just go i don't i don't want to go i don't want to go too deep into this i want to ask something so you've said that we should we should um you know look at like recent things people and so if we look if we take a farm like french wine farm in uh, in Salenbosch, do you think that those wine farms should be redistributed and, and given back to the people who lived there before just quick yes or no i would say yes but the question comes in now is Re remember there been, have been french people living there for like 400 years and we're talking were they about living like, there through inheriting the land well fair enough but the inheriting people who were, it, the people who they stole it from stole it from people before inheriting them. it inheriting it like the store the Inheriting stolen land. Stolen land just kept on being passed on. Mm. Passed on, right? Stolen from who? Stolen from the indigenous the indigenous African people who were who were inhabitants of that land, right? Well those people stole it from the people who were there first. In okay, are we dealing with the Cape? Let's deal with the Cape. Sure, let's, let's deal, deal with, with the Cape. Cape. Let's deal with the Cape. Deal with the Cape area of Stellen. That Stellenbosch region. That yes. that Cape Town Cape Town region. Yes. People the people who were there, the indigenous African people who were there were there at that time yeah. were the Khoisan, the yeah. Khoi and the San, right? Okay. 
um more so let's say the the koi the koi people right and the sand people right mm. and um that's the that's the tribe of people that we now know right let's not deal with the area which later became known as um kwazulu and then through the the english the english um colonization be- then Na- kwazulu it then became kwazulu natal let's let's not deal with that side right let's not deal with that side in how people came down and moved to that side right let's deal with that side right those indigenous african people who were inhabitants of that land that land was violently stolen from them by the Dutch and the French mm. at the time, right? And there, there was genocide that took place. And so, if we deal with that land and the expropriation of that land, yes, I truly believe, as a Pan Africanist myself, I do believe that it should. It's the rightful thing to do, right? However, now you're going to deal with the problem as to because there's genocide that's taken place by the, the 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 thieves that have stole the land, the invaders who took the land and um and for example we 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 will not um we won't get to an immediate an immediate standpoint as to where the land goes because history history along the lines has been has been um has been forcefully erased as well and undocumented so we're not going to know exactly where it goes yeah. as people living in the 21st century and okay, have so to deal with the 1600s you like it, you, like so, it, you let me go you to this let me make my let me you go have to a tendency my, to not answer the question no let me go to my point let me okay, go to my go point to i'm point. going to my point now so this is why i said you need to deal with the present now you deal with the present now that land is owned by um is owned by by um white white males right yeah. and who are the majority of the people who are living in the area right you have got colored people who are unemployed who are unemployed who don't have access to um to economic resource you've got um black african people who are also in the same financial mm-hmm. standpoint what do you then do then you have to expropriate according to um according to assisting people who live in the area who have been um who have been dispossessed and as well as um disadvantaged by the system which has allowed for those that stole land and continuously um continued continued to pass on stolen land and it, isn't, isn't that a, isn't that an extremely it, nationalist idea which nationalist so if you which want to idea? Say, okay because so you have it, to deal with that right what so, i'm saying is you deal with that because there are people who are unemployed there unemployed and don't have access to wealth and capital and whilst wealth is being generated and wealth is being generated on stolen land and wealth is being generated by a minority and it's also being generated by foreign because you also have to take take into account that a lot of the land in the country is owned by foreign foreign um foreign groups right Mm. and so that you it also now raises the complication of that land must also then be expropriated back to the state, right? So then that can then be expropri- expropriated to the people of South so Africa. So you think that the land should be owned by the people who predominantly inhabit that area? The um, yes. Okay. That's what, that's so does so so that what that is saying, and I want you to think about the real world ramifications of this, is because if if you have a let's let's simplify ex- down. Use the let's, example that we're on to now, yeah. the Western Cape yes. example. So let's say I am a I'm and take the government. account the issues of the Western yes. Cape. So so imagine I'm a I'm a governor and there's a community in the Western Cape where there's a, a white guy who owns a, a a big farm and then surrounding that there's a community which is mostly black people so let's simplify down let's say there's one white guy and 50 black guys and they're all living in this area you think that since those black people are the predominant people in that area they should be allowed to use that land and create and wealth have been in that historically land. disadvantaged have been historically dispossessed and placed in a, in a very compromising position historically which has still led to their continuous continuous disadvantage today and you know so what when you deal with let's talk about the cape because I, I like the cape example when yeah. it comes to the wine farms of the cape yeah who worked those farms tirelessly as well that's what i that's the example that i also, well i mean they weren't also, they weren't slaves t- yeah yeah let's say it they weren't slaves they weren't slaves but who was exploited to ensure that those farms are what they are today well it answers itself. would you say Colored that african people would you right? say that that labor paid labor is exploitation it was not paid historically we now know we know that we know that when it came to when it came to um colored people um forcefully tirelessly 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 being exploited to work those farms it was not financial paid labor 
right? We know that um, we know that. Let, let's not derail and get deep into the history, but um, simple, simple, um, straightforward summary. We know that people were paid paid um, paid in the most inhumane way with alcohol, right? Okay. Right. Do you, are you aware of that well, history? Well, I I'm aware of the fact that many of the workers who lived on. So I now I own no. But are you aware of, of the specific history that people were paid were paid with the wine farms, for example, the Western Cape wine yes. farms? People were paid with 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 um alcohol with alcohol definitely, but yes. not in isolation. They were also paid um, with land and with homes. They were given places okay. to live and stay. They were given food. They they was they were told if you live on this farm and you work on this farm, we will give you food to supply your family. We will give you land to build a house on. But on let's this not farm. make it sound frank, friendly. It was not friendly under the apartheid regime. It was De not friendly. Definitely not. But, but I feel like uh, take Zuleika, it, bring it to the conditions of the present. Yes, but I, I, Zuleika, I feel like. Whenever I give you an idea or give you a topic, I feel like you will choose the perspective that makes black people the victim and makes white people the oppressors, even in situations where but that is not necessarily the case, in situations when it comes where people to land, are equal. That is unfortunately the case. Okay, but because remember, I mean, we, we need to go back to this again because there needs to be a consistent application of logic. We can't have a situation where we don't apply things consistently. If the if if a piece of land, a little piece of land next to a river with some lovely trees in a valley, if that piece of land was originally inhabited by Khoisan people, and so then a group of I'm other saying. people, because you keep going back to that point. But so I, let's I think what's important it. is because you you keep talking about how important it is not to erase history. But then when we talk about redistribution of land, you want but to erase however, all of that history. No, no, no. I'm not erasing it. I'm not erasing it. I want us to now look at. I what I speak at it. Speak of it from the perspective of the adapt the adaptations that have taken place and how we've evolved, as well as um, how oppression has continuously found its way in adapting and evolving mm. in um, in with the with the ever changing world, and that's why I brought up this example of of um, those wine farms, right? Which was the example that came from you, the Western Cape yes. example, right? And what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, I want you to look at the current present, and mm. it's not a matter of I'm deliberately saying that no, okay. Um, I don't want to hear white people are the oppressors. You know, as much as as historically they were, you know, colonization, apartheid regime, right? Today, till today, you can say yes, governmental power, for government is in power, government is is black, right? However, however, the parental supervision of the country to how the the large, the large, the large dominating forces and the larger influences. There's still that um, that Western that Western sort of parental supervision over the country, right? And there's still that Western um, that Western that Western world oppression that plays a role because um, a lot of those wine farms, for example, as well, are foreign owned, right? Mm. So, like, what I'm de what I'm saying now is we're dealing with the matter of the of the Western Cape example with the farms, right? Recent history, recent history. So describe Colored recent. People, how, how far is recent? Recent history go into the apartheid regime, right? Just now. 27 years, right? Okay. 27 years, just now. Recent history. The colored and black African people were exploited on those farms to ensure what to, to make, not ensure, ensure is a terrible word. Were exploited, were exploited, um, forcefully and unfairly so and in an unjust way and that exploitation made made those farms what they are today mm. made them these big massive sources of financial wealth and wealth generation of wealth what they are today everyone everyone we come to south africa everyone wants to go to um Stenberg, for example go to that stellenbosch wine farm right now let's talk about the inhabiting community as well right mm. You know what is happening in the Western Cape. There's large unemployment. Who is the unemployment majority affecting? Colored and black people, right? And um, there's wealth. There's, a, this, there's this mass generation of wealth taking place, right? Which many of the people there who are still alive till this day were exploited to ensure that that farm, to make that farm what it is today, right? Unfairly exploited. Ensure is a bad word. But made that farm what it is today. Built that farm on their backs mm. why is it that they cannot have a share in that today why is it and equally so equally so 
they were exploited and disadvantaged and their disadvantage has continued into today mm. by the apartheid regime yeah. which advanced the position of any white national at the time and allowed for those those farms to continue to thrive under white ownership so so let me so, tell you cuz okay. under the apartheid regime under the apartheid regime that wouldn't have happened right the farms were were still placed under white ownership those wine farms right and so why is it that those that were exploited who built those farms on their back why is it that today i'm asking you now why is it that they can't have a, a, a they can't have they can't own a certain percentage of mm. that farm and also um also have access to the wealth being generated by that farm because we cannot lie and say wine farms bring in pennies wine farms bring in large sums of wealth mm. so so you no, want to answer you, that question why can't they have a share of what they built on their back it's an easy it's an easy answer they didn't own it they and didn't own it equally so the place the people who it's under their ownership they don't own it as well they stole it well they stole it as we as i've said like 50 times no except they, they stole, stole it from it. people who stole it before and no who did they steal? No, 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 no! Don't jump! To, don't jump too much! Don't jump too much! You okay, are saying that you're people saying don't jump too much. Into Your the definition thing. of too let's much is exactly the amount of time that works that, perfectly for you. We're going back to that thing, right? Yes. I'm sorry. Like, like, just answer the question, right? So people built farms on their back, right? Mm. But you you said they can't have a share, in your opinion, because they don't own the farm. So they can't have a share, right? Of course right? not. You, you, okay. Sorry, sorry, then, Zuleika. You've said that you want to go study uh, LLB, right? Then. You want to transfer to LLB. One of the modules you'll take in LLB is called Law of Property. And Law of Property goes very deep into the Constitution. By the way, our Constitution, best Constitution in the world, they teach us, um, if you go into law of property, what it explains is that if you are the owner of a thing and someone else has that thing, the fruits of that thing belong to you. Like that's a very but important concept. But that's not concept. what we've seen. But that's, that's exactly what we've seen. And that's what you're protesting okay, against. You're saying no, that the say... owner of the farm should not be entitled to the fruits of the farm because he, because it was built by the people he employed. But if we were Didn't to take, employ, I, they think well, if you look at apartheid, it, there was no slavery in apartheid. People yes. were paid wages. Whether yes. you want However, to argue it was if those f- wages were fair or not, they were paid, they were contracted, they signed up to do that. Nobody forced them to take those jobs. They took those jobs, they Nobody were paid to take it. those jobs, okay. and they worked on these wines farm, wine farms for their labor. By consistent application of logic, Nike has their shoes made in sweatshops in Asia. There are incredible injustices going on right now. Switch Nike off. shoes are make Nike their shoes are being made by children in some cases. It's a terrible atrocity. But I don't hear anyone saying that those children should be given a you know stocks in Nike because that's not how no, it works. No, that's, that's not the same example. That's the thing. If we're dealing with land, let's deal with the land directly, right? Okay. Like land is a very direct thing, right? And Land has a deep significance for African people, right? Number one, like we can't take that away, right? And what I'm saying is, what I'm saying, because you said that you, because I asked you, right? Because colored and black people had to, were forced to, by circumstances and the conditions which were enforced, which they were subjected to by the apartheid regime, right? It was not a choice that, okay, here's nice employment. Let me take ni- nice employment. That was the only form of employment. It was a, it was a, it was a do or die kind of decision, right? Mm. So, because what else were you going to do? What else were you going to do? You've been, you've been, you, you're, you're under domination and you're under an oppressive, oppressive government. There's nothing, there's nothing else for you to do. It wasn't a, we're going to sign up to do it. Jolly Oaks, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't that, right? It wasn't that. But as much as it was, it was them, them, um, them essentially, essentially being employed. However, that employment was not, um, was not comfortable. That's why I, I keep calling it exploitation, right? Mm. It was it was exploitation, right? And so what you said is that they cannot have they cannot have a share of what they built, right? Today, which is which is one of um, what they were paid to build, we should say. What they were they fairly paid is the real question. Were they fairly paid under the conditions? Were those conditions com- comfortable to actually say that that was labor, that was paid labor, that was rightful paid labor? Would you no, say they were that, not. that under Nike's the, sweatshops, those are rightful paid 
fair labor. No, they're not. They're so, not. So it's, it's they're not. They're I'm, not. But I'm, I'm a talk- guy who pushes for consistent application of logic in everything because the problem is consistent if we application are to- of logic does not work in such circumstances because there's intersections in what that differs, but, right? Uh, but if you don't one have consistent sustained- application of logic, what you open yourself up to is corruption. Okay, because but, if we can deal okay, with look. every situation based on the opinion of the person who's dealing with it, then our if for as a matter of fact, our entire legal system falls apart. Why okay, can look- uh, because if we say that two situations based on slight differentiations, but we think that it's the same thing because it's it's it's, it's I say that they should be treated the same. Yes, I say that we should have consistent consistent application of logic because if one guy is you know stealing something out of a shop and he's getting a month and another guy is stealing uh, something from a shop and he's getting 10 years because the judges are different that's no, bullshit okay, we need wait. to have consistent legislation yes. consistent rules right this we is what i'm saying that. so what i'm saying is but if you, you want to look at a situation about- where um, a group of people who lived on a farm worked on a farm let's even say that i agree with you and they were underpaid if we underpaid want to say and placed under right. harsh so conditions, if we want to say that they're underpaid and placed under half, harsh exploitative conditions, then we also need to look at something like um, we can even take an example today: McDonald's. Right? People are but not. We're dealing uh, you've with heard land, about the corporations, f- but but we need to have consistent application of logic but where we I'm say is that a corporation today is equal to what a wine farm owner was 200 years ago it's someone who controls a lot of resources they have a lot of push and they have a lot of power within their areas and within their communities we have to have consistent application consistent of logic. application of logic works in the exact when scenarios are the same right take, or similar take scenarios that are Deal with land. Deal with land. Matters of land, right? Mm. Matters of land have consistent um, okay. application of logic but, in but matters this is of so land. Because if we're going to say that we're going to have consistent application no, of I'm, logic I'm, within I'm, land, then every piece of land in the country should go back to the Khoisan tomorrow. Because that's consistent application of logic. Okay. I hear you. I hear you, right? I hear you. However, 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 right? Let's Let's take that, right? And that's that's a that's that's valid reasoning, right? Because they were the they were the first people. The country is theirs, right? That like it's it's valid reasoning. It's valid reasoning. However, however, right? However, there's been there's been mass evolving in the country that's taken place where they've been tribes. They've been tribes from the north the northern part of the country to the western part of the country to the eastern part of the country, the central part of the country, the KZN region of the country, there's been there has been um massive massive um massive um adaptations and changes that take place, right? Where whereas in you can't necessarily say that let's say for example, right, um I'm gonna say for example, um this is a realistic example of my own. My my ancestors land was was taken from them and they were forcefully removed from their land mm. in um in in the region of um in the region of of more so what we know as in Bumalanga today by the apartheid regime right you know exactly where that land is supposed to go people have been forcefully moved off people yeah. have been forcefully dispossessed people's ancestors are laying there and they are elsewhere right mm. that's a simple thing it's a simple thing. You know where it must go back to, right? And you can't necessarily say that that land, for example, as well n- now must also must also you you can't give that land back to where the um where the where the the um the people that were living on it who it who had the land in their hands at the time it can't go back to them. Yet their ancestors are buried on the on those grounds so the reason why i said a few minutes ago is that mm. this is nationalist is because again if we have consistent application of logic and we to, were to apply this all over the world okay. multicultural nations would not be a thing like all swedish people need of, to yeet back to sweden ment- jump out of of your perspe- perspective and your framework right okay and this is this is going to be challenging given that you've never been a black person in your life but try hard to jump into the understanding and jump into the into into um jump into the shoes mm, not that of it's, some, it's easy jump like into a, the jump into the shoes 
jump into the shoes of a black person today. Yes. Okay, let me give you. Let me let me let me let me make the shoes. Let's manufacture the shoes. The shoes an unemployed unemployed hungry black person who has no land to farm, no land for housing. You're living in an in an RTP. You're living in an RTP, but the, the, there's land around you and you do not have land for housing. You do not have um land for farming to at least generate an mm. income for yourself you are unemployed you are still disadvantaged by a system a system and a a a, a um a, a a system a system which which um was was abolished by name by name by merely by name merely by name by name 27 years ago yet you are still affected by that very same system right mm. you are I, in that condition you are in that condition and your grandparents were forcefully removed mm. jump into those shoes for a minute well, just for a minute out of your obviously, own I, I out can't of your speak own for the first half we've got five minutes left by the way i can't speak for the first half but what i can speak for is out of this shouldn't be from your perspective just jump into those shoes what is the first thing you feel as an unemployed as an unemployed black black person who has no housing, no land to farm, and your grandparents were removed from land that they were living on by the Group Areas Act, for example? What is the first thing that you feel? If you were to jump into those shoes, right? And um, I'm saying this so that you can try to see the black perspective mm. right which which may be difficult for you because you've never yeah. lived the black i, I want to ask you i want to ask you the a black question. experience but Are just you, answer the question i, how I would don't you think feel? i have an answer for that question because i i couldn't i i mean obviously there, there are words that come to mind words like um frustration is is a word that would come to mind maybe deeper than frustration well i i, I don't know i've never felt that way i want to exactly. ask you a quick question do you believe in in equality of opportunity or equality of outcome opportunity opportunity is something that is also also you can't take away it is determined by access to opportunity mm. you can't take away that others are more privileged so to you, access opportunity okay so, so but but you're no you're of the belief of, that in a system in which there is equality of opportunity and everyone has the same access to opportunity people don't have the no same i know to i know i'm saying hypothetically even in that situation, there will be winners and losers. There will be impoverished people and there will be wealthy people. Is that something that you that you understand but and that you agree with? Impoverished people and wealthy people, it's a system in its own that's been created. Okay. It's a system in its, in its own that's been created that essentially under capitalism, there will be wealthy people and there will be impoverished people. It's a system in its own. The ex that's a system in its own that's created, right? And... Um, in terms of opportunity, in terms of opportunity, I would never agree and say we all have the same access to opportunity. In South Africa today, we don't. We don't. You have people who are unemployed who sit with a degree, right? But you can't say that person has the access to the same opportunity when they can't get themselves to an interview. Mm -hmm. And because they are unemployed, they don't have um they don't have um professional professional appropriate attire to wear to the to the to the interview then you take someone who comes out of a, a wealthy home interview same interview they have financial means to purchase a good suit a good tie for and they have me financial resources to take themselves to the interview it's not the same okay. it's not the same yet one opportunity has been placed but the access the access and that's the biggest thing that's happened in happening in this country is access is not the same right and which is why i've been speaking so much about you have to look at the conditions of the present today like access is not the same and um i'm of the firm belief that when it comes to opportunity for example when it comes to opportunity for example i don't believe in um in the notion of of um of merit that um that um you know opportunities are are given because of merit only. That's not the only way opportunities are given, right? Okay, Zulaika, I'm going to have to stop you there because we are out of time. Um, 
yeah, thank you very much for doing this. I've had a great time. I feel like we need to have a part two. <laughs> we need to chat about <laughs> the small. Part two. <laughs> which are the, the people who are listening, uh, people who are watching on YouTube especially, I'd really love to hear um, some comments. Like, go into the comments, tell us what you think, because I'm sure everyone listening to this has agreed with some of the stuff I've said, agreed with some of the stuff you've said. I'd like to hear if people have, like, stuff to chip in. Um, I'm sure Zuleika will probably put this on your social media. I'll put this on my social media. And uh, yeah, I would love to see what people think. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a very great, um, great discussion. Very intellectually challenging here and there. But yeah, it's thank you for having me. Um, however, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still gonna hold you to it. Try, <laughs> just try, just try your hardest to try and think from the shoes I've manufactured for you. You've never worn those shoes, but attempt at least attempt the first what is the first honest feeling deep 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 deeper than frustration it's deeper than frustration it's not just frustration frustration is just yeah like oh you know yeah i get you i understand it's deeper than that i get it thank you very much for listening and watching thank you zuleika thank you and goodbye